So what we can see here is those three methods that we talked about earlier and the advantages of each method. First of all, uh, weighted average. We said that it basically smooths out the price changes. We're going to find out that FIFO and LIFO give us extremes, and the weighted average is right in the middle. It smooths out those price changes. That's the biggest advantage of weighted average. So now let's dig in and talk about FIFO and LIFO. We have to think about this a little bit. With FIFO, remember, we're using the oldest costs that are currently on the balance sheet, but we're going to move them out to the income statement. So they're the first ones to move out to the income statement. Now let's look at prices though, the selling price of the inventory. Because on our income statement, we're going to have sales minus cost of goods sold. That gives us gross profit. And then we back out all the other expenses to give us net income. We set our sales prices based on what the most recent cost is. Now it doesn't mean it's going to be matching it perfectly obviously and it certainly doesn't mean that every time we have a cost increase we're going to up our sales price but the best relationship is between the current sales price and the current cost so because of that what we on our income statement under FIFO we're going to have a, a brand new sales price but we're going to be matching with a really old cost of goods sold figure so our inventory or our uh, cost of goods sold on the income statement, it's not going to be the best match. It doesn't mean it's wrong, but it's not going to be the best match. So our income statement is possibly less, uh, I don't want to say reliable, but it's just, it's not as good of a match. The information is not as good. It doesn't give us a good approximation of what our true net income might be. It doesn't allow us to predict into the future very well. So the income statement's not so great under FIFO. Now when I say not so great, I mean not maybe as accurate as we'd like it to be. It'll actually generally look better. The profit will look better under FIFO in most cases than it will in LIFO. The reason is, and this assumes that our costs have been increasing over time, so the reason for that is that we're matching a high sales price with a low cost of goods sold. We're going to have high profit under FIFO. So the, the bad thing is that the income statement is not maybe as accurate, as not a good estimation, but the balance sheet, on the other hand, it'll keep getting refreshed. Our balance sheet will continue to report the most recent cost. So that's going to be more accurate. The balance sheet's going to be a really good representation of what our true cost is. So FIFO, it's, it's great for the balance sheet. The income statement is not as accurate. For LIFO, on the other hand, it's the exact opposite, and to the extreme. So let's look at the income statement first. If we have costs that are increasing, our sales price is going to be a, a current sales price, and we're going to use the most recent cost of goods sold figure. We're going to most use the most recent cost to move over to cost of goods sold. Last one in, first one out to cost of goods sold. So we're going to be having a good match between sales and cost of goods sold. So the income statement provides a better match. The balance sheet, on the other hand, is a big disadvantage. In that example earlier, we said that we had that old, very first layer that we still had five units left, and we never got a chance to get back to it. If the company continues to buy newer and newer inventory, they're going to have really, really old costs that are stuck in the balance sheet that are never going to be adjusted until the company decides to sell all of their inventory to dig back into those old layers. So the balance sheet could be severely under or severely uh, understated. So the balance sheet is life was bad for that and the the income statement it's more accurate. But notice I didn't say the word good. LIFO if you have a costs if you have costs that are increasing over time your profit is going to be less under LIFO than it would be under FIFO. So from a company's perspective and from an investor's perspective, that you don't want low profit. You want higher profits. Why would you use LIFO? The answer is for tax purposes. If you have low profit, you're going to have low taxable income, therefore lower taxes under LIFO. Now, it's a, it's a tax deferral. We'll talk about that in a second. The IRS is well aware that companies may choose to use LIFO for their tax purposes and for their financial statements, they know that they're going to be deferring tax. They're going to be saving tax in the current year. 
That's fine, but there's something called the LIFO conformity rule where the IRS says if you use LIFO for tax purposes, you also have to use it for financial statement purposes. What that means is if you want the tax savings, you're also going to have to look uh, worse on your income statement. So your investors are going to see that low taxable income as well. One thing to point out here is that, again, under international standards, life was currently not allowed. So if we move to the international standards, this whole benefit may be gone as well. The companies may no longer be able to use LIFO for tax purposes either because of that LIFO conformity rule. The other thing to keep in mind is that this is just a tax deferral. They're not avoiding tax forever. Let's say they finally do decide to start selling some of that old inventory and they're going to have really low costs finally moving over to the income statement as cost of goods sold. In that year, they're going to have a lot of profit, which means they'll have a lot of taxable income. So just something to keep in mind there. Consistency. What we're basically saying here is that we would prefer companies to use the same method year after year. That way people can compare the various years. If you switch from FIFO to LIFO to weighted average, then back to FIFO, if you keep switching year after year, you're never going to be able to compare the balance sheet for the inventory or the cost of goods sold. It just won't be comparable from year to year. You'll see these big jumps or big drops, and the only explanation is that they used a different measurement method. So the consistency concept basically says we'd like you to use the same. Now again, it's not a hard and fast requirement, but if the company decides to change to a different method and they're reporting more than one year in their annual report, which is very common, you generally prepare three, five, maybe more years in your balance sheet and your income statement to show, hey, we have a trend, an increase or a decrease. So if they do that, they have to go back to those earlier years and restate them as if they had used this current method all along. That makes it comparable. So it's a little bit extra work for the companies to use, companies to do. So they may really want to consider that first. Now we have another topic. I mentioned uh, goods that were obsolete or damaged. This is another adjustment to those costs. It's called lower of cost or market. So what we're basically saying here is we may have situations where we reduce the cost of our inventory below what we actually paid. It's a conservative adjustment, so we only adjust downward. It's the lower of either the cost that we currently have reported or the market price. The key thing I want to point out here is the market, when they use that term market, it's really misleading. When you think of market, you think of the market we sell on. But that's not what we're using here. We're using the market that we purchased this product from. In other words, the wholesalers, the maybe even the manufacturer, what did they charge us as a store to buy their merchandise, to resell it? So it's replacement cost. It's not sales price. So what we're saying here is if we have some computers that we bought, we bought a whole bunch of a certain model of computer, and the sales, we haven't had as many sales as we expected. So we have a lot of those old models of computers on hand, currently reported at cost. But then we go back to the manufacturer and we find that, hey, we can buy that same model for a really low price now because it's out of date. It's obsolete. In that case, we would want to adjust our balance sheet down to the current replacement cost as if we bought it at that particular price. Now, as far as adjusting those, we could do it three different ways. We could do it separately for every single item. We could do it just to categories of assets. Or we could do one big adjustment to the whole inventory. We'll see an example here. So we have a motorsports retailer with the following items in inventory. They have a group of cycles, two different types, and a group of off-road vehicles, two different types. They give us the number of units on hand the cost per unit for each of those four and the market price per unit. Then they give us a total cost, total market for each line item, each category, and then the grand total. So we want to know, we're not going to do it on each individual unit, we're going to do it on each type of unit. And I should, when I say type, I mean all the roadsters. They're all the exact same price per unit, so we can do all the roadsters at once. 
all the sprints at once. Then we'll try the whole category of cycles. And then do the same thing with all the off-roads, all the types of off-roads, then the overall category. And then we'll adjust to the overall total cost. So what we're going to do here is we're going to take a look and see whether the cost is already lower, therefore no adjustment is needed, or whether the market is lower, which means we need to adjust down to the lower market. Here our total cost was 160000 for the Roadsters. Our market was less at 140000 therefore we're going to be adjusting down to 140000 With our Sprint, we have 50000 total cost. The market was higher at 60000 so our cost is already lower, therefore we no, don't need to make an adjustment. For the off-road, the Trax 4, our cost is 40000 the market is 52000 we don't need to make an adjustment, cost is already lower. For the Blazer, it's cost of 45000 the market is lower at 35000 so we're going to use that lower market, we're going to adjust down to that market. Here's what our total is if we do it that way, $265,000 compared with the $295,000 total cost or the $287,000 total, whoops, total uh, market. So we made quite a bit of an adjustment. Now we could do it on a category basis and then on a whole basis. So with the categories, what we'd be doing is our total cost here is $210,000 but our total market is only 200,000 so we would adjust down to the total market that would flow over to this section and for our category for the off-road our cost is already lower at 85,000 and the market was 87,000 so what you can see there is that our total cost for the category that we're going to report would be the 200 plus the 85,000 so it would be a $285,000 total as a whole we just look at these numbers right here. Total cost, total market. Total market's less, so we'd be adjusting down to 287000 So now you may question why, when we apply the LCM to each individual item, why does this get so far below either of these two balances? The reason is we're always adjusting down, so we're kind of taking the worst out of each line, the lowest cost out of each line, and that's the most conservative number we're going to arrive at. Each of these numbers, you know, sometimes the cost was higher, sometimes the market was higher, so each of these numbers, it's not taking the worst of each line, it's taking what that line actually is for cost or for market. So that's why this is so low. As you disaggregate it, or as you aggregate it, I should say, to get to your categories or your whole, you start to see the adjustments becoming less and less. So the next topic we have here is inventory errors. So for this to make sense, we have to go back and look at our inventory calculation, our cost of goods sold calculation. We start with beginning inventory plus cost of goods of or um, plus cost of goods purchased so plus purchases I should say inventory plus purchases equals the cost of goods available for sale throughout that year this is what we could sell from that we subtract out cost of goods sold those that we did sell to get ending inventory the items we have left we didn't sell these so now we have to take a look at what happens if we understate either ending or beginning inventory what if we make a mistake with either the ending or the beginning inventory. If we understate the ending inventory, what we're saying is we had a certain amount available for sale and we usually, you can, by the way, you can either subtract out cost of goods sold to get ending inventory or you can subtract out ending inventory to get cost of goods sold. Either way that would work. So if we understate ending inventory, because that's usually what we do. We usually find out what we physically have, subtract that out, and that tells us what we must have sold. So if we understate ending inventory, what we're saying is we must have sold this product because we don't think it's on the shelf. So we overstate cost of goods sold by that same amount. One thing I want to point out here, cost of goods sold and net income 
have a, have an inverse effect, or cost of goods sold has an in, inverse effect on net income. So if you overstate cost of goods sold, which is an expense, that means your net income is going to be understated. So you'll see these are always the opposite. So if we understate ending inventory, we don't think we have the product left, which means we must have sold it. We overstated cost of goods sold. And I'm going to go down to this overstating ending inventory. It's the exact opposite. We have so much that we could sell, and heck, it looks like a whole bunch is left on the shelf, so we must not have sold much. We understate cost of goods sold. Now let's go to beginning inventory. If we understate beginning inventory, we don't even think we have the product there to sell at all. So when we subtract out what we really do have as ending inventory, we say, you know what, we didn't think we had much to sell anyways, so our cost of goods sold is going to be lower as well. We don't think we sold much because we don't think we had much to begin with. The opposite is true. If you overstate beginning inventory, you think you have all of this product to sell, you compare it to what's really on the shelf, and you say, well, heck, we must have sold a lot. We thought we started out with a bunch, so we must have sold a whole bunch of product. This slide is a little bit easier to understand, your balance sheet effects. If you understate any inventory, which is an asset, you're going to understate the asset. If you overstate any inventory, you're overstating the asset. That's pretty common sense there, or pretty logical, let me say it that way. Now, the other thing to note is that assets equals liabilities plus equity. We know our basic accounting equation. Liabilities are not even in the mix here. We're not even talking about liabilities. So if we understate our assets, that means our equity must be understated as well. Same with if it's overstated. The reason this works, by the way, is if we go back here, we saw that net income was either understated or overstated. That has a direct impact on equity. If, if net income is understated, equity is going to be understated, and vice versa. So the last couple of slides we have in this section are our ratios related to inventory. So the first one we have is the inventory turnover ratio. The way I like to illustrate this is by thinking of a store that just sells one product. We're just going to simplify it, but it works for companies that have several different product lines as well. Inventory turnover, this ratio is basically an average. But let's go back to the one shelf situation. A company starts their business, they have an empty shelf. They buy some inventory, fill the shelf up, and then they sell it all and empty it back out. They go buy some more, fill it up, empty it out, fill it up, empty it out. Those are turnover cycles. Every time they filled it up and sold it, that's one cycle, one turnover cycle. A company obviously would want to do that as many times as possible. That's how they're going to be profitable. So that's why they want to know this inventory turnover ratio. To get this number, you take the cost of goods sold for the year divided by the average inventory for that same year. Average inventory, it's a simple average, beginning plus ending inventory, divided by 2. So that's your inventory turnover ratio. The higher, the better. It means you're operating more efficiently. It means you're not keeping an excessive amount of inventory on hand. You're just keeping enough where you can sell it and liquidate it from time to time. Your day sales and inventory, it's very similar. It's uh, related. It's kind of, you you'd want to use these two hand in hand, they're complementary. So this tells us how many days of inventory do we have. If we were to stop buying inventory and we were still selling it, how many days would could we go before we would run out of inventory completely? How many days sales do we have left in inventory? So we get the ending inventory, not an average, just the ending inventory balance divided by cost of goods sold for the year times 365, the number of days in that same year. This converts it to a day figure. So, again, here we have, we have an issue. We want to take a look at what is better, higher or lower. It depends on a lot of things, but the higher number, that would mean that you're keeping a whole lot of inventory on hand, which costs money, it ties up your cash, and you have a risk that this inventory may become obsolete, it may be damaged, all of that. On the other hand, if you were to go, if you were to stop buying more inventory, you could go quite a few days before you'd stock out. So again, you don't want too high of a number. But on the other hand, you don't want too low of a number either. A low number means that hey, you have low cost. You're not keeping a whole lot of inventory on hand. There's very little risk 
that you're going to have obsolete inventory and you don't have to pay for a huge warehouse. The problem with a really low number, though, is that if something happens where your shipments are delayed due to weather, due to supplier issues, you may stock out. That means your customers will come in and your product, the product they want won't be there. They won't be able to buy it. If it happens once, it's not probably such a big issue, but if you com continually have these problems and customers know that, or they expect that when they come in, hey, it's not going to be there, they're always out of my product, they're probably going to start going to a competitor. So that's the issue with having too low of a number of day sales and in inventory. You have to really manage your inventory to handle that. And that takes us to the end of this chapter. Hopefully this information has helped you to understand inventory a little bit more. I thank you for your time, and I will talk to you in the next session.